yo what is good everybody welcome back to the channel y'all already know how we doing man with these reactions we got another one um hey fellas man y'all gotta be careful out here with these women man especially you know them, them trying to set you up bro because this one right here is top three honey trap murder cases all right for y'all that don't know honey trap is you know the pot you know what i'm saying so without further ado we're gonna jump right into it but my last video i did not do what i was supposed to do this video we're gonna do it um lord heavenly father jesus we're gonna protect our mind eyes and ears with what we are watching myself my viewers please keep us safe and guarded from all demonic spirits in your name i pray amen let's get right into this video y'all i ain't gonna hold y'all up According to a court affidavit filed in the case, he had suffered blunt force trauma to the head, he'd been stabbed, and his right thumb had been cut off. Welcome to Urban Crime Stories. In this episode, we will examine three honey trap murder cases more people should know about. Before we continue, please subscribe to the channel and turn on all notifications so that you will not miss any upcoming episodes. Number one, the tragic story of Shekylas Townsend. Shaquilis Townsend, a 16-year-old boy from Croydon, United Kingdom, was known by friends and family as a kind-hearted and caring individual. He had a deep sense of loyalty and affection for those close to him. Despite his youth, Shaquilis had a dreamer's heart and longed for love, which he thought he found when he met Samantha Joseph. Their relationship was only a month old, but Shaquilis quickly became infatuated with her. He believed Samantha was the one for him and, without hesitation, shared with his mother that he wanted to marry her one day. His love was pure, driven by his hopeful and trusting nature. Unfortunately, Shaquilis's feelings for Samantha were not reciprocated in the same way. While he was pouring his heart into the relationship, Samantha Joseph had different intentions. Behind Shaquilis's back, Samantha remained deeply fixated on her older boyfriend, Danny McLean. Although she accepted Shaquilis's attention and gifts, her heart and loyalty were still with Danny. Samantha used Shekylis, manipulating his feelings for her while keeping her true desires hidden. She confided in her friends, admitting that she didn't care for Shekylis and only viewed him as a tool, something she could use to her advantage. Despite Samantha's manipulative behavior, Shekylis remained completely unaware. He was utterly smitten, even oblivious to the fact that Samantha was playing a dangerous game with both him and Danny. His deep affection made him blind to the warning signs, and he continued to shower her with love and gifts, hoping that one day she would feel the same way about him. His desire for her was so intense that he ignored any hint that she might be using him, choosing instead to believe in the image of the relationship he had built in his mind. Danny McLean, a prominent member of the violent gang known as Shine My Nine, or SMN, ended his relationship with Samantha when he discovered she had been seeing Shekylis Townsend. Despite their breakup, Samantha's obsession with Danny never faded. She was willing to do anything to regain his affection, even at the cost of betraying Shekylis, who was deeply in love with her. Danny, fully aware of the power he had over Samantha, exploited her desperation. He told her that if she truly loved him and wanted to win him back, she had to set up Shekylis, ensuring his downfall. Samantha, Eager to please Danny, agreed without hesitation, sealing Shaquillis's fate. The tension between Shaquillis's devotion and Samantha's manipulation came to a head on Thursday, July 3rd, 2008. This day marked a turning point in Shaquillis's life, a day that shattered the illusions he had about Samantha and his relationship with her. He had no idea that Samantha had devised a plan with Danny, a plan that would lead to an act of betrayal so brutal that it would cost him his life. Shaquilis, trusting and full of love, could never have anticipated the storm that was about to hit. On the day of the tragic event, CCTV footage captured Samantha meeting Shaquilis. She wore a see-through floral dress, a deceptive appearance that hid her true intentions. To anyone watching, they seemed like a typical young couple, laughing and enjoying each other's company. Shaquilis had no idea that Samantha had orchestrated the events of that day with Danny. 
The two boarded a bus together, with Shaquillas believing they were on their way to meet Samantha's cousin. Throughout the journey, Samantha remained in secret communication with Danny via her cell phone, updating him and coordinating the ambush that was to come. Shaquillas, in his trusting nature, was completely unaware of the deadly trap being set for him. Samantha skillfully led Shaquillas to a quiet cul-de-sac, a secluded area perfect for what was about to happen. She continued to play the role of a loving girlfriend, masking her betrayal with ease. But instead of meeting her cousin as Shaquillas expected, he was ambushed by Danny and five members of the SMN gang. The attack was swift and brutal. Armed with baseball bats and knives, the gang showed no mercy. Shaquillas was beaten savagely with the bats, and in the chaos, Danny and his gang members stabbed him repeatedly. The betrayal was complete. Shaquillas had walked into the trap Samantha and Danny had set, unaware that the person he loved had delivered him to his attackers. Shaquillas was stabbed six times, leaving him mortally wounded. As he lay on the ground, bloodied and battered, the gravity of the betrayal and his impending death began to sink in. In his final moments, Shaquillas, still just a boy of 16, cried out for his mother. His last words were filled with fear and desperation. I don't want to die. His voice echoed in the empty street, a heartbreaking plea that no one was there to answer. The image of Shaquillas, lying helpless and alone, calling out for the person who had always protected him. After the attack, the coldness of Samantha Joseph's actions became even more apparent. As Shaquillas Townsend lay dying in the street, she showed no remorse or guilt for the betrayal she had orchestrated. Instead, CCTV footage captured her walking away from the scene alongside Danny, as if nothing had happened. She casually carried his hoodie and a cream-colored handbag, which was stained with Danny's blood, a reminder of the savage violence that had just unfolded. Danny had sustained a minor injury during the brutal attack, but Samantha remained focused on him, acting as though the life they had just taken was of no consequence. Shaquillas Townsend succumbed to his injuries on July 4th, 2008, a day after the brutal attack. Despite being rushed to the hospital, the severity of his wounds was too much for the 16-year-old to survive. His death marked the tragic end of a young life filled with love, dreams, and a belief in a future that was stolen from him. The community mourned the loss of a boy who had been betrayed by those he trusted and the senseless violence of gang culture that had claimed yet another victim. In the months that followed, Justice was served for Shaquillas. Samantha Joseph, Danny McLean, and five other gang members, including Andre Thompson and the Ellis brothers, were found guilty of murder. Their participation in the premeditated ambush and savage attack on Shaquillas led to heavy sentences. Danny, the orchestrator of the plan, was sentenced to a minimum of 15 years in prison for his role as the leader of the gang that took Shaquillas' life. His manipulation of Samantha and the brutal way in which the attack was carried out highlighted his cold, calculating wait, nature. Wait, wait, pause, pause, time out, time out, time out. Fam, you mean to tell me they he calculated a murder and that's all he got was 15 years? Whoa. Whoa. He still got a whole life ahead of him. He could do that 15 and come home and... He's not even gonna be that old because he's a young dudes, man. Like, come on. What that's a joke. That's a joke, bro. I always feel like this life for a life, bro. I don't believe in death penalty. I believe in you take a life, you need to be life and in prison. Like life in prison. That's that's what it is, bro. How you don't give him life is crazy to me. Then you don't even give him 25? I never even agreed with 25, but to only give this man 15 years is an insult, bro. This is an insult. I never heard of this case either. And usually what I like to do is do my due diligence and look it up. So if y'all watch this, go look these things up. Make sure that we fact check it because I saw some pictures in there. One of them was an old picture of the of an actor. He was in the, um, in the Woman King. He played the King in the Woman King. I, I, I peeped that. That's why y'all saw me look a little crazy, but um, I just let it proceed. It looked like an old picture of him probably like back on Facebook or Instagram or something when he was younger, but yeah, that was wild. But anyway, 15 years is a joke, bro. It's a joke. And this it's is nasty work, like how she just walked off with him like nothing ever happened. 
Like they ain't just put in work and just kill somebody. I mean, granted, at the time they didn't know, but when you do these things, that could be the case. You could kill somebody. Several other gang members also received lengthy prison sentences for their involvement. Andre Johnson Haynes, a former public school boy and promising London Irish rugby player, was sentenced to a minimum of 12 years in prison. Brothers Tyrell Ellis and Don Carlos Ellis, along with Michael Akinfenwa, also received 12-year sentences for their part in the attack. The sentencing of these young men, all from different walks of life, revealed how deeply the culture of gang violence had infiltrated their lives, leading them to commit acts that would destroy not only their own futures, but the life of an innocent boy. Samantha Joseph. They got to work on that on that system, bro, because they, they all got slaps on the wrist. 12 years, 12 years. They still have a life after that, bro. They still have a whole life ahead of them while this boy is gone. That's wild. 12 years is wild to know that somebody participated in a murder. I don't care how old, young, whatever, especially for them, they were older than him. So, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't catch like how old everybody was that was involved, but they did say that her boyfriend, I believe the, the lead ringleader was at least an adult. I don't know about the rest of them. But still, 15, 12, this is ridiculous, bro. These are slaps on the wrist. Who had been the key to luring Shaquillas into the ambush was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Her role in the betrayal, despite her young age, showed a willingness to go to deadly lengths to gain the approval of Danny. After serving her sentence, she was freed in 2019 and deported to her native country of Trinidad. The legal system's handling That's the of same case girl? left many questioning whether justice had truly been served as the mother of Shaquillas grappled with the pain of knowing her son's killer had been released after a decade. Andre Thompson, another key member of the gang, was sentenced to a minimum of 14 years in prison, a term that was later reduced to 13 years and three months. His involvement in the murder, like the others, underscored the devastating consequences of gang allegiance and violence. Though all involved were brought to justice, the sentences could never repair the damage done. For Shaquillas' family, the pain of his loss, coupled with the betrayal that led to his death, would remain a constant reminder of the tragedy that unfolded on July 3rd, 2008. Number two, the murder of Saul Murray. In the early hours of February 27, 2022, Saul Murray, a 33-year-old father of six from Luton, United Kingdom, was found dead in his Luton flat, with his body bearing multiple stab wounds. What began as a night of excitement and allure quickly spiraled into tragedy as two women drawn to Saul's vibrant online persona lured him into a deadly honey trap. As the investigation unfolded, the community was left grappling with the shocking betrayal that led to Saul's tragic end. Known for his vibrant personality, Saul lived life to the fullest, often sharing moments from his daily life on social media. His profiles displayed a keen interest in fashion frequently showcasing his affinity for well-known brands. These posts painted a picture of hey. a man who enjoyed the spot. Hey, hey, I say it all the time, bro. This is to all the people who do this type of stuff, bro. Stop posting on social media, bro. Stop posting on social media. Only is posting Rolex watches. Bro, there are people out here that see this stuff. The Jack Boys is out here. Stick Up Kids is out here. And they not just female, uh, males. They females too, bro. They females too. I keep saying that. Yo, move in silence, bro. If you getting money, you get into the bag, stop broadcasting it on social media trying to flex. Because all you're doing is you opening yourself up to get got. And I, I hate to say that and I hate to sound cruel. But I'm just being brutally honest. Y'all got to stop posting everything online, bro. You got to understand a Rolex watch is more than some people's mortgage, bro. A Rolex watch, forget just a mortgage, depending on the Rolex you get, could cost more than somebody's whole entire house. So, bro, y'all got to stop posting everything online. That's the moral of the story, bro. Spotlight and appreciated the finer things in life. 
However, it was this very visibility that drew the attention of two young women who devised a scheme to ensnare him in a honey trap. Captivated by his lifestyle and charm, they aimed to exploit his online persona for their own gain. Under the guise of friendship, they reached out to Saul, hoping to lure him into a situation he never anticipated. Their intentions were far from innocent, as they crafted an elaborate ruse designed to pull him into their web. Supreet Dillon, a 36-year-old from Gillingham, and her 21-year-old accomplice, Temedayo Al, had their sights set on Saul Murray after noticing his extravagant lifestyle showcased on Instagram, particularly the eye-catching photos of his Rolex watches. What did I just say? What did I just say? Stop posting everything online, bro. Intrigued by the allure of his wealth, they initiated contact with him, exchanging friendly messages that eventually led to sharing their telephone numbers. Saul, drawn in by their charm, extended an invitation for the two women to visit him at his home in Luton late on February 26, 2022, unaware that their interest in him was far from genuine. The evening of their meeting began with an air of excitement as the women traveled to Luton, both eager and scheming. As they Bro, y'all gotta stop inviting girls to y'all houses too. Stop that, bro. We gotta get out of the whole culture of bringing girls to the crib. I'm gonna bring these, these, you know, jump balls. When, when I was younger, they used to call them jump balls. Now y'all call them thoughts. You know what I'm saying? Hoes, whatever. Yeah, excuse my language, but y'all gotta stop that, bro. If you wanna do what you wanna do with a female, you got money. He posted in the pool. He got Rolexes, all that. Why are you bringing them back to the house? But you know why they do that is because he's trying to use that to show off. He's trying to flex. Like, yo, look at my crib. You know, come through. Come sit in the pool. Ah, you know what I'm saying? He's trying to riz them a little bit. But this is when rizzing goes wrong because you try to do that and they plot it on you and they set you up. Now, they could have done the same thing at a hotel, but at least they wouldn't have known where you were. You could, And you got to be on your A game. You got to be on your P's and Q's. You got to make sure that you don't see no funny business. When you're around certain people, if you see them constantly on their phone, you got to question that. If you see them if you, and if you feel off, if the vibe feel off, then you got to vacate. If you would have been in a hotel, you could have just dipped out. You could have just left out, even if you paid for the night. If you felt like the vibe wasn't right, you wasn't feeling how, what they was on, they was moving on some funny time, and you thought something was coming towards you, then boom. Oh, I'll be right back. I'm going to go get some ice from the vending machine, whatever, whatever. You step out, and you cut out. You don't go back. Y'all got to move smarter, man. Move, move smarter because especially now, bro, they setting you up big time. Females are big time setting up dudes. And they don't even be thinking. They be getting drunk. They be getting high. You know what I'm saying? Or out their mind, not even paying attention. And dudes be getting got like that. So y'all got to really move smarter, bro. They entered Saul's home, captured on CCTV cameras. They presented themselves as friendly visitors ready for an enjoyable evening. Once inside, they shared liquor, engaging in lighthearted conversation and flirtatious exchanges that quickly escalated into intimate activities. For Saul, it seemed like a dream come true, a chance encounter with two captivating women. However, the reality was far more sinister, as Supreet and Temedayo had come up with a premeditated plan to exploit his trust. As the evening progressed, Dylan discreetly slipped GHB, a date rape drug, into Saul's drink, intending to incapacitate him for their thieving plot. Although the drug was meant to render him unconscious, the quantity used proved insufficient leaving Saul still aware of his surroundings. This unforeseen complication prompted Temedayo to make a critical decision. Sensing that their scheme was in jeopardy, she quickly left the house to fetch two other accomplices who could help execute their plan more effectively. While Temedayo was away, Supreet remained in the house with Saul, attempting to maintain an air of normalcy despite the escalating tension. The minutes stretched into an eternity so you mean to tell me dude might have still been alive had they given, given him the right amount to knock him out? They would have probably just went in his house and took all his stuff. But because they gave him too little and it didn't work, she then had to go get help. This is crazy.
opportunity as she navigated the precarious situation, carefully balancing her act of feigned interest in Saul while mentally preparing for the arrival of her partners in crime. With each passing moment, the risk of discovery grew, creating a palpable tension that loomed over the evening. Approximately 20 minutes after Temidayo left, two men were captured on CCTV entering Saul's property, marking a significant turning point in the unfolding events. The footage showed the men entering with a sense of purpose, a stark contrast to the seemingly casual atmosphere that had filled the home moments before. Just 10 minutes later, the two women were seen leaving the premises together, a hurried exit that hinted at the gravity of the situation inside. As the camera panned, one of the men was clearly visible, brandishing a knife, a chilling indication of the violent intentions that had now entered the fray. The scene had shifted dramatically from a night of flirtation and trust to one of impending danger. The two women having initiated this deadly chain of events now found themselves part of a much darker narrative. The following day, Saul was discovered in his flat, lifeless. Authorities determined that he had died as a result of heavy bleeding from a stab wound that had pierced a vital artery. The gruesome reality of his demise sent shockwaves through the community, revealing the hidden dangers lurking beneath the surface of seemingly innocuous encounters. The investigation that ensued would uncover not only the circumstances of his death, but also the nefarious activities that led to it. Forensic tests conducted on Saul's body revealed that both Temidayo Abu and Surpreet Dillon had engaged in sexual contact with him shortly before his death. The shocking detail added another layer of complexity to the case, indicating that the women had not only exploited Saul's trust, but had also played a direct role in the tragic events that unfolded that night. Moreover, high levels of GHB were found in his blood, confirming that the drug had been administered during the evening, further complicating the timeline of events. This combination of sexual assault and violence pointed to a calculated plan that had spiraled out of control, leaving a trail of destruction in its wake. Temidayo and Surpreet were the first suspects arrested in connection with Saul Murray's tragic death. During intense questioning, both women denied any knowledge of the two hooded men who had entered the apartment shortly after their departure. Their refusal to explain or provide details raised suspicions, leading investigators to dig deeper into the circumstances surrounding the case. To unravel the mystery further, police utilized GPS information to track down the unidentified men who had fled the scene in a vehicle. Their efforts quickly led to the arrest of 29-year-old Cleon Brown, who was identified as one of the individuals connected to the incident. As the investigation unfolded, it became clear that the web of deception and violence extended beyond just the two women, highlighting a larger conspiracy. The breakthrough in the case came when investigators spotted the second suspect who wore a distinctive designer coat valued at 1,300 British pounds at Takeaway Food Shop just days prior to Saul's death. This detail proved crucial in identifying him as 31-year-old Ikim Afia, who was also apprehended shortly thereafter. The coat became a key piece of evidence, linking Afia to the crime scene and reinforcing the connection between all parties involved. As the arrests were made, the grim narrative of betrayal and violence continued to unfold. The authorities faced a complex case involving multiple suspects, each with their own motives and stories. The investigation now centered on piecing together the events leading up to Saul's death, seeking justice for a man whose life was taken too soon. Akeem Afia was ultimately convicted of murder, receiving a life sentence with a minimum term of 25 years. His role in the brutal attack that led to Saul Murray's death was deemed particularly heinous, reflecting the severity of the crime and the impact it had on Saul's family and community. Afia's conviction marked a pivotal moment in the pursuit of justice, bringing a measure of closure to a tragic case that had captured public attention. Cleon Brown, Ikim's accomplice, was handed an 11-year prison sentence for his involvement in the events that transpired that fateful night. While his role was less direct than Afia's, the court recognized that he played a significant part in the conspiracy that led to Saul's untimely demise. In a separate but related outcome, Temidayo Ao faced a mixed verdict in her trial. She was sentenced to seven years for manslaughter and an additional six years for conspiracy to commit robbery to run concurrently. Despite being involved in the events that led to Saul's death, she was found not guilty of murder, reflecting the complexities of her involvement in the case. Surpreet Dillon received a similar sentence, with the court handing her 10 years for manslaughter and another 10 years for conspiracy to commit robbery, 
also to run concurrently. Like all, Dylan's role in the tragic events was acknowledged, but the jury ultimately differentiated between manslaughter and murder in their deliberations. Number three, the disturbing. Now, I'm trying to figure out how they dodged that bullet. I mean, I guess you could argue and say that they didn't have the intention of murder. They just had the intention of the robbery, but that doesn't matter. Um, but then again, that's the UK. So I can't really speak on the judicial system in the UK because, you know, completely different from the United States. So, you know, that's kind of weird that they definitely should have got hit with murder. You know what I'm saying? But it is what it is. Dude who killed him, though, he seemed like he just was out to kill somebody because there was two dudes. Yeah, I could have really overpowered him, tied him up, and robbed him. Like, I I'm not telling y'all how to commit crimes. I'm, I'm, Listen, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying there was another way without actually taking this man's life is all I'm saying because valuables can be attained. You can, you can repurchase, rebuy, a lot of that stuff, especially Rolex watches. Pretty sure he had insurance on that stuff. Um, he also probably most likely had homeowners insurance. So they might have, you know, covered certain things as far as theft goes. But um, he can't get his life back. You can't. The, the only thing that life insurance does is it ensures the people that are still alive that survived after you are taken care of. But it doesn't help the person who gets killed. So. It's an unfortunate situation, man, you know, and it goes to show how desperate people are because these women actually slept with dude. So they didn't even they could have just gave him the drug, but they actually slept with the dude and then gave him the drug. That just comes off like they was on some nasty stuff, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, that, that's nasty to me to go to to go to those extreme measures. But hey, wh who am I to judge? Right. Case of Fasil Teclamarium. In early April 2024, 53-year-old Fasul Teclamarium was brutally murdered in his Washington, D.C. apartment. The Metropolitan Police responded to a report of a stabbing, discovering Fasul's body with multiple injuries, including a missing right thumb. As details emerged, it was revealed that Tiffany Gray, a 22-year-old woman who had benefited from Fasul's generosity and her accomplice were behind the heinous act, exploiting his trust in a calculated plan for financial gain. Fasil was known among his community for his calm demeanor and generous spirit. Described as an easygoing man, Fasil had a reputation for being kind-hearted and always willing to lend a helping hand. His generosity extended beyond his immediate circle, and one person who particularly benefited from his giving nature was Tiffany Gray, a 22-year-old woman. Fasil was known to be her sugar daddy, frequently spending money on her and showering her with gifts creating a relationship built on financial support and companionship. Tiffany enjoyed the luxuries that Fasil provided, and their relationship was well known among those who were close to them. Fasil, though significantly older, seemed content in his role, always willing to fulfill Tiffany. Goes back to what I said in the last one, y'all. Y'all dudes gotta stop being out here tricking. Stop tricking off on females. Because a lot of dudes who trick off on females, it's a flex, right? They do it to stroke their ego. They want to flex like, I got it. I got you. And they want to do go above and beyond to try to impress her. But all that does is it makes her come in the gate with dollar signs in her eyes. So she's she's from the beginning of whatever situation I got going on, she has no respect for you. She only respects your money. She only values your money, not you. So... A lot of y'all got to stop leading with money. Stop leading with money. What? Yo, bro, when it come to women, you can't lead with money. You can't lead with your you know what, your little, your, your mini me. You lead with those two things, you're going to either rub her or rub her the wrong way or she's never going to respect you. You got to lead with this, bro. You got to lead with your mind. What's going on up here? If you're not leading with your mind, you're not going to find the right woman. Because if you leave with your mind, you you can weed out these type of women. They won't even be attracted to you. They won't even talk to you because these type of women are only about one thing. So if you leave with your mind and you put that out there, then you let her know what type of woman you're looking for right out the gate. And by you doing that, you don't get into these situations. That's all I'm saying. Needs and desires. 
Despite their unconventional arrangement, there appeared to be no tension or conflict between the two, and Fasil's life carried on peacefully. However, what many didn't realize was that beneath the surface of this seemingly smooth relationship, things were about to take a darker turn. In early April 2024, Fasil's life took an unexpected turn, shattering the semblance of peace he had cultivated. On what started as an ordinary day for him, soon spiraled into a series of events that would ultimately alter the course of his life. The tranquility that Fassel was known for vanished, and in its place came confusion, fear, and uncertainty. As the day unfolded, it became clear that something was terribly wrong. On April 5, 2024, the Metropolitan Police Department responded to a chilling report of a stabbing in Washington, D.C. Upon entering Fassel Teclamarium's apartment, officers were met with a harrowing scene. Fassel lay lifeless in his bedroom, the victim of a brutal assault. He was discovered with multiple traumatic injuries, most notably a missing right thumb, a detail that would become pivotal in unraveling the mystery surrounding his death. The subsequent autopsy revealed the full extent of the violence he had endured, including severe blunt force fractures to his skull, numerous lacerations, and a stab wound. Additional cuts on his legs and the gruesome amputation of his right thumb painted a horrifying picture of the circumstances leading to his demise. Now, the first thing I think about when I, when I heard about the, the thumb, that sounds like that was to gain some sort of access to like a safe. Maybe he had a safe or somewhere where a safe was. He needed, they needed to get access to a room or a safe that he had that required like some sort so, uh, of, some sort of biometric. Um, same thing or, or his phone or his phone. I don't know because a lot of people bank through their phone. As investigators meticulously combed through the crime scene, they uncovered evidence suggesting attempts had been made to sanitize the area, indicating a deliberate effort to conceal or destroy incriminating evidence. Despite these efforts, certain clues remained, including distinctive footprints that could potentially lead them to the perpetrator or perpetrators. The chaotic nature of the scene suggested a violent struggle, compelling detectives to reconstruct the timeline of events that had culminated in this tragic outcome. Every detail, no matter how small, was crucial in piecing together the narrative of that fateful night. Security camera footage from the lobby of Tecla Mariam's apartment building emerged as a critical piece of evidence in the investigation. Over the days leading up to his murder, the recordings captured two individuals present in the building on the night of the incident, just hours before Fasil's body was discovered. Over the days leading up to his murder. All right, I want to point this out right away, right? Now, look, I'm not trying to judge nobody, bro. I'm not. I'm just keeping it all the way a thousand, keeping it a stack. Shorty over here with the black on. Look how she got her cleavage all out. Guys, y'all got to stop chasing after that. Because that. The woman that dresses like that, that carries herself like that in public, usually isn't a good look, bro. And I know there's gonna, there might be some women that's going to say, ah, well, I dress like that and I don't act like this and I don't move like this and I don't do that. But at the end of the day, when you move like that, yeah, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's, that's the trap right there. The, the epitome of a honey trap. That's it right there. You looking right at it. In fact, we might even put her on the thumbnail like that because that's it right there. That's how y'all be getting caught up because y'all see that and y'all do dumb stuff. Murder, the recordings captured two individuals present in the building on the night of the incident, just hours before Fasil's body was discovered. Among them were Tiffany Gray and her accomplice, 19-year-old Audrey Miller, who were seen returning to the building on April 3rd at approximately 2 a.m., their actions suggested a sinister motive as they entered the premises carrying bags and boxes, later seen exiting with various items belonging to Fasil. This behavior pointed to premeditated theft, raising alarms about their intentions in the name. Yo, y'all, that's another thing I want to bring up. Y'all older men, stop doing this, bro. Stop. Y'all, if y'all older like this, bro, dude is probably almost old enough to be their, their father, man. Like, why are you playing with these young girls? You know they don't want to be with you, dude. 
They want the young boy with swag, with drip. You know what I'm saying? They want to take your money from you and go give it to the young boy that they're interested in. They're not trying to be with you. What makes you think like, bro, y'all got to use common sense, man. I, I hate to say this, but and I'm not trying to sound mean, but y'all got to use some common sense. These young girls, they're kids, 18 and 19 years old. This man is in his, what, 40s, 50s? Bro, they're not interested in you. Come on, man. Nature of their relationship with the victim. The surveillance stills depicted masked figures in hooded sweatshirts, their identities hidden as they made off with Fasil's possessions. This footage prompted detectives to delve deeper into the backgrounds of Tiffany and Audrey, unraveling a troubling narrative that contradicted the image of a straightforward arrangement between Fasil and Tiffany. Investigators soon uncovered that Tiffany and Audrey had allegedly exploited the trust Fasil placed in them. Disturbingly, they used Fasil's severed thumb to gain access to his financial accounts, extracting funds for personal. Duh. I knew that right away when I heard the, the cutting of the finger. I knew it. I said it. Sinister, bro. That's a whole nother level of evil right there, bro. They was like, yo, forget the fact that we already did what we did because he probably was dead when they did that, most likely. I'm assuming. I could be wrong. But they was like, nope, we don't care that we killed him. We still, we came here for the money. So, hey, yo, man, we ain't taking his body. Take his finger off and let's go. That's crazy. That's like a movie. Personal indulgences such as Uber rides, marijuana, and alcohol. This chilling act of betrayal underscored the lengths to which they were willing to go to benefit. Hold on, run that back. Run that back. Did he just say what I think he said? Hold on. ...had allegedly exploited the trust Fasil placed in them. Disturbingly, they used Fasil's severed thumb to gain access to his financial accounts, extracting funds for personal indulgences such as Uber rides, marijuana, and alcohol. This so y'all did all of this for Uber rides, marijuana. Oh my gosh! Are are y'all are they for real? Like what? What was the point? Chilling act of betrayal underscored the lengths to which they were willing to go to benefit from Fussell's generosity. On June twenty first, twenty twenty four. Law enforcement made a significant breakthrough in the investigation of Fasil Teclamarium's brutal murder with the arrest of Audrey Miller. Charged with first-degree murder and armed felony murder, Miller now faces serious legal repercussions and is currently in custody, awaiting a preliminary hearing. This development underscored the severity of the crime and the violent nature of the events that led to Fasil's tragic demise. As investigators pieced together the details of the case, it became evident that Audrey's involvement was part of a calculated plan, raising questions about the deeper motives at play. Just weeks later, on July 1st, authorities apprehended Tiffany Gray in Prince George's County based on a warrant for her arrest, also charging her with first-degree murder and armed felony murder. The quick action taken by law enforcement highlighted their commitment to ensuring that those responsible for Fassel's death face justice. As the investigation progressed, it was revealed that the motives behind the murder were a disturbing combination of financial gain and personal vendetta. This unsettling motive suggested a level of premeditation that painted a chilling picture of the relationships between Fasil and the suspects. Tiffany's arrest in Prince George's County marked a crucial moment in the investigation. Once extradited to Washington, D.C., she will face serious charges that could result in severe penalties. The decision to pursue first-degree murder charges against both women indicated that authorities believed they had meticulously planned their actions, viewing Fasil not merely as a companion, but as a target for their ruthless schemes. What are your thoughts about these tragic stories? All right, y'all. So that's it, man. Moral of the story, like I said from the beginning. Watch the company you keep. Don't go on social media flashing off your money, your jewelry, your clothes, your cars, your homes, none of that. Keep your life private as possible. 
And when you're talking to these women, if you 10, 20 years older than them, you already know what type of time they on. They don't want to be with you. They are most likely using you and trying to set you up. Don't rush in. Only fools rush in. Stop letting these people come to your home. I don't know what y'all be thinking. Even if you're trying to do some stuff you shouldn't be doing, you know, trying to get your little freak on, whatever. Bro, do that somewhere else. Go to a hotel. Stop bringing them home. All right. And lastly, lead with your mind. Like I said, lead with your mind, not your, your young man down there and not your money, because that's how you get caught up in these situations. You lead with your mind. They see that you're about intellect. And usually that's what you put out there. That's what you want. And that's what you're trying to receive. And the chances are you're going to make those type of women flee from you. All right. So y'all get down in the comment section. Tell me what y'all think about this one. These all these stories are crazy. This last one was probably by far the worst one. Um, and as y'all can see, that just happened in April of this year. So, you know, that that deserves a movie on its own, man. But anyway, I'm out, y'all. Peace.